395. Now, it won't be the 2028 MotoGP top speed, but instead something equally spectacular as the newest and latest Paddock Pass podcast rushes into existence. I am Adam Wheeler, and I wish I could say I'm delighted to be connected with two other wise and old hacks. But the truth is that I've seen far better things on my computer screen today. In the interest of productivity, though, and catharsis, because this will also be on YouTube, I will endeavour to make the best introductions for David Emmett and Neil Morrison. Dave, uh, you've been in the UK and uh, sharing some childhood photos from your family home on WhatsApp uh, with us recently. The sheer innocence of those Emmett Jr. images uh, are just ruining <laughs> things for me here because when I look at my own children, I know what could be in store. Well, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's the old, um, um, uh, what is it, picture of Dorian Gray thing, isn't it? Only in real life. Uh, all that uh, all that innocence and, uh, and youthful beauty. Um, it soon ran out there, sort of as, uh, pretty much as soon as I hit my late 20s, it was, uh, it was all gone. So, yes, that's something for your kids to look forward to. But it- I'll tell you what was, what was really it, what I really enjoyed, and I posted the, the photo on, on of the picture on Twitter as well uh, of me sitting on my uncle's grass track bikes as about, I uh, would have been aged like maybe five or six. Um, and just, I still remember that feeling of joy. And it's the same feeling I get of joy I get every time I swing my leg over a motorbike. It, you know, some things just never go away. There's a great photo, Dave, of you when you're maybe about 12 at a family function dressed in like rather fancy clothes and you're <laughs> you're sporting a wonderful skull, which uh, is really reminiscent of when you're made to wait a bit too long at a rider's debrief at the end of a test day. <laughs> that was, I mean, yes, no, but my mother literally said about me that she was the worst teenager she, uh, that I was the worst teenager she ever, uh, she ever came across. So yeah, and I look back at all those pictures, there's like pictures of me, all sorts of um, doing all sorts of family things and uh, by God, I knew how to look um, miserable i don't know those kind of official school photographs look pretty quaint dave i mean is there any chance you could post one maybe on patreon discord or even on your own twitter thing just to <laughs> I, mean, I would do it just for those flowing locks yeah no that would uh, that's um I, i'm trying to l- limit the exposure of my photographs to the uh, uh to, to the world it's not it's not good for anyone at least for least of all for me Neil, you've been busting the pedal power in the last two weeks and you won't be coming to Austin this week. Um, how difficult was it to resist the allure of the an authentic American burger? Uh, more difficult to resist the allure of the <laughs> authentic Austin tacos, I would have to say, the breakfast tacos in particular. Dave and I were talking last night about how difficult it's going to be to miss out on that this year. But um, yeah, with uh, with Argentina's cancellation, uh, money-wise, it didn't really make sense just to go out to America for five days because it's just got so expensive. And I thought I would maybe save uh, some funds for later in the year when uh, I'll be going to Japan for the first time. So um, yeah, that uh, I think should make up for it. Well, speaking of cancellations, British Airways have already cancelled my flight, so it's going to be fun flying to Dallas instead of Houston and then driving on. Let's see if I can actually get there first. Um, Coming up, we're going to blast through six talking points or topics before round three and the Red Bull Grand Prix of the Americas, including Fabio Quattararo's contract extension, Cotta form and a bit more. But first... Last year, KTM made a surprise model launch when they unveiled a limited edition KTM RC8C track bike. The motorcycle sold out in minutes and the company have produced a 2024 version. We have to stress that this is not a road bike. It's 100% for the circuit and it can only be ordered online as limited to 100 units. So anybody keen on a ready to race talk fest of potential might have already missed out. It weighs 142 kilograms with a special track chassis and is loaded with WB Pro components, the LC8C engine spits out 135 horsepower and there's a slew of race ready specs like brembo brakes Krapovich exhaust and lots of aero expect moto 2 levels of performance purchasing the ktm rc8c also involves a vip handover event on may the 8th at portimao that includes a track setup session dinner a meet and greets and exclusive track day experience with KTM Race Royalty. Have a look at KTM.com now and check the Supersport category under models just to see if there's any of those special machines left. Okay, guys, first of all, uh, the news came out. Fabio Quartararo, let's talk about him. Uh, Dave, does money talk or is um, Fabio being overly optimistic about Yamaha's soon swift return to competitiveness? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, it, it's complicated. I wrote a big story about this last night um, on MotorMatters.com. 
uh, it seems from reporting by Oriol Puigdemont, who knows these sort of things, who writes for motorsport.com, that um, um, the choices that uh, Fabio had was uh, 12 million euros to stay where he is, um, making him the best paid rider on the grid, or 4 million at Aprilia. Um, so he didn't have a lot of options. And yes, 12 million is nice, but I think there's more to it than that. I think there is, there's also, money can also be an expression of how much a, um, the, the stakes or the, the, the skin a factory has in the game. So if you're paying someone a lot of, mo- a lot of money, you also need to give them the tools to do the job. Um, you know, there's no point in throwing sort of, you know, millions and millions at a rider and then sort of spending 60 quid on uh, some bloke in a, uh, in a in a shed in Altrincham to build a MotoGP <laughs> bike for them. Uh, you really need to have a, you really need to sort of invest to extract the investment. That's, that's the gamble that they actually, um, that, that Yamaha or that really that Fabio is making. He's saying, look, Yes, I'll take the money, um, but you need to make sure that I can win on this. Uh, you know, he's he's forcing Yamaha into investing in him, but also investing in the bike to give him the the, the changes. But also, we've seen at, at um, the Sepang test, Yam- he ha- well, Yamaha have made a lot of changes, and Fabio has been raving about the changes made, such as at uh, especially the, the arrival of Max Bartolini, um, the performance engineer. Um, and what a difference he's made in the garage. So, yeah, I think it's uh, the money was nice. There was also a bit of a lack of options, but also um, by forcing, you know, he, he's trying to force Yamaha to give him what he needs. Two things. Uh, maybe, Neil, you can come in here first. You know, Yamaha was clearly the best option for Fabio, but is Fabio really the right option for Yamaha? Uh, you know, he has a an important input for the development of the m1 and maybe the direction of the motorcycle for the next couple of years now and secondly if yamaha are able to spunk say audios on the money in terms of getting the money right with 12 million then what does that mean for having a second team you know if they do ink a deal with vr46 then we're talking about some serious budget going into their MotoGP program again right yeah i think that's that's always been the way with the japanese factories in MotoGP. gp they've always been able to to spend a bit more on rider salaries than their european counterparts um is fabio the best option for yamaha yeah i would say so he's the, the best option available i still think fabio is definitely among the best five riders in the world currently and the best five riders in MotoGP gp for sure um with the right tools at his disposal i have no doubt that he would be fighting for the world championship um and you know yamaha have been able to to see how he works up closely over the last couple of years um obviously he brought them a title in 2021 and if you think about it this yamaha this crisis that yamaha are currently engulfed in would have begun um a lot earlier than it than it did um had fabio not been there the likes of rossi vinales uh morbidelli were all having torrid torrid times when Fabio was winning the championship in 2021 and nearly winning the championship in 2022 so yeah I think you could say that that it's definitely a great great deal for Yamaha Um, and in terms of the budget that they've had I think you know they have had to really demonstrate to Fabio um, that they do do mean business and um, you know the the salary is is one part of that Um, but some of the changes that they've mentioned I think also played a big role Max Bartolini coming across from Ducati. Also, I think it was Marco Nicotra, who's now their senior aerodynamics engineer, has come across from Ducati as well. That's a, a sort of aspe- an aspect of bike development that Yamaha had before neglected to address. Um, it does seem that they're kind of on board with with that. So there's been big structural changes um, to how they operate as well as changes to the bike. Um, and uh, and yeah, it was enough to, to convince them in the end. Um, part of me would love to have seen Fabio jump ship and go to a different factory. But realistically, you know, he was never going to be in the running for the, the factory Ducati team just because they already have a line of three very, very capable riders trying to, to take that seat alongside Pekka Banyai next year. Um, and then Aprilia, you know, if Oriol is on the money, he usually is. Um, yeah, uh, taking a salary, which is a third of, of what your, your current employer is offering. I mean, it's difficult to do that. And we do have to remind ourselves that Fabio still is only 24 years old. He turns 25 later this month. So 
it's not like a kind of Mark Marquez situation last year where you feel he's coming to the end of his career and he needs to make a big change to be competitive immediately. You know, Fabio does still have many years ahead of him. So, um, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I can see. I can see why he's done this. A uh, quick question: You said that uh, you think that Fabio is still one of the top five riders in the world. Who are the other four? Um, Mark Pecco, Martin, and Binder, Pedro, Acosta, probably. Acosta already in MotoGP. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay, that's a big yeah, call. No, no question. That was. I mean, like that's that's the one thing about Acosta. Uh, like, I mean, I, we, I did watch the races. Obviously, you know, I couldn't be there because I was with my mum, but I did watch the races and watching Pedro Acosta sliding both wheels through turn 15 at, 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 at Portimao, you're thinking, okay, this kid might be okay. Might be, might be, you know, sort of semi-decent on the bike. Um, a, a question I would like to pose to both of you. Has Fabio bottled this? Because we've seen... Aprilia has the potential to have at least finished on the podium in the first two rounds of the season. Um, it looks potential-wise like it could be excellent. We know that Fabio historically is a better rider than both Aleix and Maverick. I mean, this is a chance to jump onto a ready-made competitive package that can fight with Ducati. Do you think that it's a missed opportunity for him? Money I think, it's, I think it's the conflict between short term and long term because short term, Neil, you're right. I mean, if Cotter is thinking, you know, 2025, I want to win the championship here and now, then yeah, maybe he has been a little bit cagey. But if he's looking a little bit further down the line, I mean, I was just doing the research now, actually. I mean, Monster Energy uh, did their last contract renewal in 2022 with Yamaha. I mean, it's an association that's been going for 10 years. They've been title sponsors. I just looked it up in 2000, since 2019. So you'd imagine if Yamaha have the kind of budget to be able to sign Quattararo like that, and then they're also going to be dealing with another team for uh, two more M1s, then, you know, have Monster have been able to stump up? It's, and frustratingly, it says a multi-year contract extension. So we don't know if 2024 is the end of it and they're already talking for future years and they've got that extra money to secure things. But I think Quattararo must be in a position where he's surrounded by the kind of activity, the promises, maybe early telltale signs that things are improving. And if he knows that it's a work in progress, perhaps very much like Luca Marini's found out in his first month's HRC, that there is going to be some sort of light at the end of the tunnel, then why not take the massive paycheck and think, okay, I'm going to be able to win Grand Prix again in a year's time. I mean, it might not even really be that long. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, two things. First of all, um, look at Mark Marquez. I mean, there is no doubt, there is no question about Mark Marquez's ability, uh, and yet it is still taking him time to adapt. So first of all, you have the point that if, um, like, even though the, if you like, the character of the Aprilia and the Yamaha are relatively simple in that they're both sort of quite high corner speed bikes, um, it's still, Quattro would still take time to adapt to uh, to a different bike. He's never ridden an, another bike. So that means he's losing at least half a, uh, uh, half a season. Um, then, of course, we've got rules changing in 2027 um, and everyone's building new bikes. So we've got no real guarantees about what happens after that. Um, and finally, I mean, why would you not sign for Aprilia? Well, what happened to Maverick Rinia Vinales in the uh, in the Grand Prix on Sunday at Portimao? Um, his gearbox sort of locks up or stopped working for no particular reason. Um, that is, it's not uncommon for Aprilia to have technical problems. Um, if you, I mean, there are rumours and sort of a, a chat around the paddock that things are not always as well organised behind the scenes as it should be. Um, these things get back to riders. You know, you see a string of technical failures. We've ha we've talked about it before on the podcast, you know, like uh, Alicia Spargo, I think in, uh, uh, you know, Mategi when he forgets, when he, when he, uh, they, um, the thing is still on the rate or still on the, out on the sighting lap. Uh, and, you know, the heat problems that they've had and then other technical problems, the, 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 you know, the list is endless. And every time they fix something, they seem to create a new problem. That is not a sign of uh, long-term thoughtful engineering. It's, it is a sign of, of a, a very aggressive approach to development, um, but it's a big, big risk as well. Um, so I think maybe Fabio has 
sort of looked at that and thought about the risk. And if it had been offered more money, then maybe he'd have taken it, but uh, otherwise not. Um, and the other thing about a Ducati, Ducati were never going to offer him a lot of money because they're of the only, you know, they only ever offer a rider one rider a lot of money. That's going to failure to Pekka Banyaya. Obviously, he deserved it. He's won a bunch of, cha- he's won two championships on the bounce now. Um, but they basically tell you, you know, what we what we offer you is not a lot of money, but um, uh, a, a bike you can win a championship on, um, and then go off and find, you know, source your own sponsorships and stuff to make money on it. I mean, Quattararo has won a championship. Uh, we don't really know the extent of his hunger and his ambition. If he wants to be somebody who wants to log, you know, his name in many columns in the record books, or he's, you know, happy already being there. But Neil, I mean, I don't want to, we don't have to jump off the Quattararo subject immediately, but I think now this puts almost the, the spotlight onto Jorge Martin because he's going to be facing the same situation. Does he try to go for that factory to carry seat or does he re-sign again for you know Bologna on a reduced fee or does he take the sort of four million for Aprilia and have faced the same sort of dilemma that Dave was pointing out for for Quasararo there yeah it does reduce his uh, his options somewhat um I think he could probably had Honda into that mix ad and um you know ask for 10 million euros or however much uh, from HRC to try and um try and tempt him away um, but yeah, he, he definitely faces some big decisions in the next, um, in the next couple of weeks or next couple of months. Um, it doesn't seem like Ducati are in any huge hurry, um, to, to sort of, um, decide who Pekka Banyai's teammate will be next year. Um, but yeah, I would say Yamaha was the obvious, or more team was the obvious, uh, replacement if, if Quattarao did leave. Um, and now that option is close to him, but yeah, I think, um, if you're Jorge, um, yeah, it sort of boils down to to those three factories. I mean, you know, Ducati factory or or maybe a place in a prettier Honda. Uh, I think the longer it takes for Ducati to make a decision about who's going to be riding alongside Paco Bagnaia, the la- the greater the possibility the probability that it's going to be an A Bastianini. At least that's that's definitely the feeling that I get. Would Bastianini, if he's ejected out of there, go to Pramac, Dave? Would that no, be or is it? Too- he- he will go to Aprilia. I mean, basically, it's going to be. I think one of the seats in Aprilia is going to be between Bastianini and Martin. Um, maybe even both. Who knows? Um, uh, but yeah, I, I think that whoever doesn't get the factory, the, the factory Ducati ride, is going to be looking at the factory Aprilia ride um, as either first or second choice. Probably as a as a second choice because the. Factory Ducati ride is absolutely sort of lo- it's a locked in chance to win a world championship. Um, however, you will get paid uh, whatever Gigi Delinia finds sort of down the back of his sofa in terms of uh, in terms of salary. Guys, I would um, put it to you that you know on the eve of the Red Bull Grand Prix in the Americas, there's going to be a lot of attention, of course, on the track house team. I think they've even got some of their NASCAR or some of their Cup cars doing some demo laps at the weekend at Cotta. Are Aprilia perhaps the manufacturer most in transition or looking the most unstable in terms of what riding personnel and kind of team investment they could have for next year? I mean, they KTM look a little bit more consistent. I mean, you'd say the popularity of Jack Miller, of course, Pedro Acosta retaining him is going to be priority number one. Brad Binder's already sorted. So that's three spots there you would assume are going to be full for the Austrians, whether that's going to be two KTM teams, or it's going to be Gas Gas again, or perhaps even MV Augusta, who this week uh, launched their Veloce um, Enduro or kind of adventure model. So I mean, things are already moving for MV Augusta. So I, I, I would say that, yeah, okay, of, of course, Honda with Joan Mir. I mean, he's somebody else that's coming to the end of his contract cycle. We shouldn't discount him because he's a former world champion, of course. But I pretty had to seem to have a lot more question marks around them than any other brand at the moment. I think all four. Uh, I think Aprilia could lose all four riders easily, um, and the only person who would have any choice in that would be Alessio Spargo. I think Alessio, if Alessio Spargo wants to continue racing, he can continue racing in the uh, factory Aprilia C, uh, team unless uh, you know something remarkable happens. And I think also the fact that Quattararo signed for Yamaha rather than Aprilia it increases the chance of um, Alessio keeping his seat. 
As we said, um, our second talking point, uh, the team focus on track house is going to be pretty big this weekend, Neil. Uh, Joe Roberts finished on the podium last time out and now being linked heavily with the American racing setup for uh, 2025. Uh, you know, it's going to be a cool Grand Prix, you'd imagine, um, in Texas this weekend for, for the newbies. What do we think about track house? I mean, do they already have the clout and the possibility to overhaul the riding lineup, as Dave says, or will they be a little bit more cagey and, and sticking with Miguel Oliveira would be a sound move? Yeah, I think at the moment, um, Miguel Oliveira would be, I mean, I think it's, firstly, it's way too early, I think, to be talking about who's going to be at track house next year and whether Miguel Oliveira needs to stick around or not, because you know, he hasn't shown anything close to his full potential this year so far. Um, he was decent in Portugal without being spectacular. Um, but um, but yeah, I guess the, the you know, the Roberts link is, is definitely a valid one. And just with, with everything that's happened over the last couple of weeks with um, with the, the Liberty Media acquisition of MotoGP, I was sort of thinking back to some of the, the recent things that have happened. And it, it does, I mean, it does make a lot of sense now that um, Dorna pushed so hard to, to get... Um, crypto data and rnf out of moto gp getting an american team in there which could potentially field an american rider in the in the near future i mean that would definitely have been a nice little nice little sweetener for for the you know the liberty owners to to look at um but uh, but yeah it should be a really interesting weekend for for the track house team as i said you know Oliveira still isn't quite up to speed yet with the uh, with the new Aprilia, but i think there were signs in portugal that he's coming to coming to understand the new package and i think it will be just a matter of time he is obviously a quality rider um and once he once he kind of understands it i think we can you know expect him to be showing some of the form that we saw um in the first half of last year before he was plagued by um you know a succession of uh, nasty injuries Dave, when you see the puzzle pieces being clicked into place, it does make you realize that discussions behind the scenes are ongoing even months and years in advance, as Neil hints, you know, with the kind of maneuvers with regards to the teams and nationalities, the deals that have been talking about and could potentially happen. I mean, we, we must also forget, mustn't forget that Liberty Media, the deal is agreed in principle and it's in place, but still needs to be passed through some various regulations, approval processes before it's all completely signed off. But um, Trackhouse are now, I would argue, one of the more curious teams in the paddock just because of the ownership and the potential and you know some of the maybe left-wing changes that we could see coming into the sport. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, there are definitely going to be changes, but I still think the like Liberty's main focus is going to be on promoting the sport in the US. It, it was also quite interesting. There was a story in the Financial Times that um, Bridgepoint actually turned down a higher bid for um, uh, for Dorna. Uh, they uh, something like two hundred million more from TKO, I believe the organisation is, which also own UFC and a couple of other championships. WWE. Um, yeah, exactly. They, they said something because of um, um, uh, because of like a, you know cultural changes. Uh, again, I think we escaped um, uh, or cultural differences. I think we, I think all of the fans saying you know worrying about. Um, uh, Liberty turning MotoGP into WWE um, uh, dodged a <laughs> bullet there, um, but uh, yes, I, clearly the the talks for Bridgepoint that has been going on for maybe for at least a year, um, so that would make a lot of sense about you know replacing CryptoData RNF, a team which was on you know financially extremely dubious uh, ground anyway. Um, with a a big American name linked with a big American sport uh, to sell it to a big American entertainment organization, um, yeah, I, I, it does make uh, it does make a lot of sense. And it also, I think, it really shifts the focus to racing in the U.S. And I think um, uh, I think it also really increases the chances of seeing, of seeing a second GP in the U.S. Yeah, I think we saw uh, Greg Maffei, the uh, CEO of Liberty Media, speaking to one of the American uh, news channels last week. I forget which one, MSNBC it might have been, um, in which he was saying just that, Dave, that um, you know they're looking at 
expanding the kind of presence in America in terms of the number of races. He didn't think there would be a chance to hold as many as three races like there is in Formula One, but, um, but certainly they were looking at, or they will be looking at alternatives um, or maybe another event to run alongside Cota, um, which I think is interesting. And um, yeah, I also saw an interview with Carmelo Espaleta, CEO of Dorna, um, I think with Mr. Helmet on uh, on YouTube, in which he was saying that yeah, this this deal was basically a year or just over a year in the making. So that kind of runs back to to last year, um, and it also makes you wonder about Dan Rossomondo's appointment. Was that also a, a something to to show that Dorna wasn't just a, a company based in Spain with a an entirely um, Spanish um, upper management group? Um, you know, it was willing to to branch out a little bit and to to kind of add to its roster names from a more international background yeah i think uh you know donna are actually going to be holding a press conference um prior to the rebel grand prix of americas this week so maybe we'll get some more answers perhaps some insight on the timing there but let's move on to our third point here in the podcast today guys i've got an interesting question for you um you know the circuit of the americas is a venue where we usually see some of the you know some of the old you know, legends of the past, some of the old races popping up from Grand Prix history. So I have a question, which American racer from 1985 to 1995 would fare best in MotoGP today? And before I get your answers on that one, um, I'm going to say mine, which I'm going to nominate Wayne Rainey, um, purely because of mentality, I think. Uh, You know, I do wonder how he he will cope in this sort of era of promotion and social media and being outspoken and stuff. I don't think he really had that extroverted kind of personality that you maybe saw in terms of sort of Kevin Schwantz or Randy Mamola. But, uh, you know, I think Rainey's approach and his dedication in terms of bike setup and getting everything on point, you know, would really work in the current era of MotoGP. But also a quick mention to um, uh, Pat Hennon, who was, of course, the first Premier Class Grand Prix winner from the US, uh, passed away this week. So thoughts of him. It was only 70, I think. Um, Boulder Count's quite a shy guy. I mean, we wanted to get Dennis Noyes on the podcast this week to talk a bit about Pat, because I'm sure the the guys would have known each other. But uh, I think Dennis is actually going to join us on the post Austin show where we can ask him then. Um, Dave, as well, I know you sort of quite really into uh, Neil, of course, to into the history of the sport and um, Pat Hennon. I can't remember rider. what happened last week. I don't know why you're asking me <laughs> about history. Well, Pat Hennon was like a guy I think you know really used the prominence of the Daytona 200 to you know really launch his name on the international stage. Uh, there was riders that were very sort of famous in the US, Gene Romero, Gary Nixon. Never really made that transition to the world championship, but uh, Hennon used that sort of springboard. And and Neil really it was a shame that his story was over so soon, um, you know, due to an accident at the Isle of Man. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think he was a rider with with great potential. Um, my parents, I think, were there at the TT that year um, when he was racing in 1978, and said just that you could tell that he was immediately could tell that he was from American. Just the kind of the the white leathers were were, were a total contrast to what you would see from most of the the road racers that um, you know had grown up racing around road circuits in Ireland. Um, and uh, yeah, you have to say he was he was a pretty handy rider. I mean, I never really got to see him ride, but um, that year in the 500 CC World Championship, I think he was just one point ahead of Kenny Roberts before the TT, leading that championship, which was obviously it went on to become a real famous duel between um, Kenny Roberts Senior and Barry Sheen. Um, he went to the TT that year because his salary was so low, I think, from Heron Suzuki, um, and he needed uh, he needed the, the the kind of the start money from the TT to to basically. You know, make a bit of uh, make a bit of coin, and um, you know, showed himself to be a, a pretty handy rider there. Um, just before his crash, I think he set the first ever sub twenty minute lap uh, of the Isle of Man. He was battling with Tom Heron uh, for victory when he had that crash at uh, Bishop's Court, which is a really really fast uh, part of the track. So, um, yeah, it was uh, it was sad to hear that um, that he passed away this week, um, and one of those stories of of you know what could have been had it not been for that accident. The accident was, uh, it's never been fully cleared up, has it? I mean, there's some people that say that he was struck by a bird on the helmet. There was other people that say he clipped a curb. And there was even some debate that he may have even had contact with his teammate. But uh, yeah, talk about sliding doors moments. I mean, uh, Hennon pretty much didn't vanish from the sport. He was still working in the motorcycle industry after that. But uh, it really is a, a what could have been kind of question mark really in, in sort of 500cc Grand Prix racing history. 
yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, yeah, one of those things where, I mean, would he have gone on to have the success in the sport as, as someone like Kenny Roberts Jr. or then after that, Freddie Spencer, maybe not. I don't think he was as big a talent as that. But then, for someone that is, you know, was relatively new to the World Championship, he was he was doing a pretty good job. So yeah, we'll, we'll sadly never know. Dave, who's your American racer then that would uh, prosper in MotoGP today? My American racer who would prosper in MotoGP is Eddie Lawson, uh, in part because if I, I mean, Neil will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I think uh, Lawson won on three different brands. He won on a Honda, a Yamaha, and a Kajiva. Kajiva. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, also, uh, did uh, did he? Win? I think he won back to back championships on different um, uh, on different brands as well. It, he was just exceptional. He, I mean, uh, talking about the. Um, the attitude and uh, approach necessary. Lawson absolutely had it. He was just only he was only interested in one thing, and that was winning and beating other people and making other people's lives miserable. Um, and that is what it takes to succeed at this sort of level. Um, I think he was also one of the first riders to start properly training, to start you know like using fitness as a tool. Um, so I, I think I actually think that Lawson is criminally underrated, even though he is still rated as one of the greatest in the world. But I think I think he's often overlooked because of the the, the glamour of Schwantz and because of the relentlessness of Rainey. Um, but I think Lawson Lawson is a bit overlooked, and I think Lawson would have had what it takes to really succeed in the current era of MotoGP. He would have got his head around everything that needed doing. He was smart as well. He was very smart. Um, but he had his, he, he would have had his, had the smarts to get his head around how to ride a MotoGP bike with all of the best, uh, uh, all of the bits and pieces um, sort of quickly. He didn't rely on natural talent. He He had natural talent, but he also had the intelligence to understand that sometimes you need to do things differently to go fast. Um, we are talking about 2024 MotoGP here, Dave. So I can imagine Eddie Lawson dancing to a TikTok video very nicely. I'm sure that would be a great fit. I would also there's, like there's to a, be... There's a, there's a great um, interview. It's a fantastic interview um, a clip somewhere. I can't, I, I can't remember, but it is basically uh, a TV interview has gone up to him um, uh, standing, outside his, um, uh, standing outside his motorhome and he's sort of standing there with his shirt off being interviewed and Eddie Lawson, he, he looks like the the the, the TV interviewer is holding a live turd in front of his uh, face <laughs> instead of a microphone. <laughs> Genuinely, the look of just sheer dis disdain and disgust on his face is just magnificent. And for that, um, I salute him. Well, I would like to be front and center of his media debriefs when you're asking him questions, you know, about um, his rear tire. I'm sure it would have been fantastic reactions. I can remember seeing an interview with him. There was a, a pit lane reporter for TV chasing after him. I think it was the 1988 Austrian, uh, no, actually might have been 87 Austrian Grand Prix at Salzburg ring. Um, trying to keep up with him, asking him what's going on, why he's not being competitive that weekend. And he just gives some sort of answer like, yeah, bike race is like shit. <laughs> that's it you kind of think you know i would just can you imagine sort of pekka bagnaya or you know kind of um brad binder or someone doing that today it's uh it just uh, just wouldn't happen i'm not sure eddie would be the best equipped for the modern era of sports promotion could you imagine uh, the uh, press officer yeah, um yeah eddie um look we've got this media training lined up for you um can, while you were available on the uh, uh on the 23rd um yeah good luck with that one but I think I think your point about adapting to different motorcycles and machinery. I mean, if he was facing a, a twelve million or a four million euro contract decision between motorcycles, then perhaps the money would uh, not be such a factor for somebody so versatile and you know attuned to the the purposes of racing. But then I think one thing I, I couldn't really stand Eddie Lawson. I just didn't feel I couldn't relate to him very much, and I was too young to appreciate his technical skills. But uh, he was kind of unpredictable. I mean, to be able to sort of leave the Japanese or Bahamoth at the time and jump on a um, a very unproven Italian product in, in Grand Prix racing and make it a success uh, just shows a lot about the man's class. Neil, uh, is there somebody who stands out for you or are you an Eddie fan as well? I mean, I'm, I'm a big Eddie fan for sure. Um, I, I, I can see sense in both of your decisions. I would probably opt for Freddie Spencer. If we wanted one single season or maybe two, seasons of of brilliance i think freddie 
um, was probably the most naturally gifted rider of, of all of the Americans. Um, so I think he would have had talent to, to adapt to MotoGP machine um, as quickly as, as anyone, if not quicker. Um, and there were a couple of things that, a couple of facets of his riding, which I think would have stood him in fantastic stead for modern day MotoGP. Firstly, he could start ridiculously quickly. Um, I remember writing an article about him um, during the pandemic and going back and watching some of the old races from like the, the mid eighties. And basically the race was decided after half a lap. It was kind of like what you see in formula one nowadays, Spencer would have got the whole shot and not just got the whole shot, but would have got two seconds of whole shot and being able to basically um, start riding at ridiculously fast pace from the very start, which I don't think many other riders could have done. Um, so the race was basically over after, uh, after a lap or two. Um, we know how important spot starting and, and starting the race as quickly now is. So I think that that would work in his favor. And also he seemed to have a kind of almost otherworldly feel for the front tire. His autobiography was titled Feel, um, and he did countless dirt track races, um, riding on dirt when he was younger, um, and how he could kind of feel the, the the front tire. I think was was something that was was not really seen in in motorbike racing um, at that time, um, and we know how tricky it is to manage front tire front tire pressure at the moment. So I think that would also work in his favour. So um, yeah, his. Uh, his right wrist might not be the strongest um, and he might not be able to do a lot of consistent races for more than a season or two. But I think if you wanted uh, mm -hmm. one standout season, I think Freddie could be your man. It's a superb argument, Neil, especially because my first thought when you nominated Freddie Spence was that maybe you had made some dodgy calls in Moto2 and Moto3 commentary about track limits and we're looking to regain some credit back in your name. But uh, yeah, you know, uh, Good observations, of course, Dave. My question about Freddie Spencer is: Is there parallels to Mark Marquez, where you know he's an Ameri a, a fantastic, marvelous talent, but then it's only really proven on one motorcycle, and one brand? Yeah, I mean, uh, also um, careers very much marked by injury. Uh, although I think Freddie's was cut, uh, cut short a lot earlier than the Marks was, but um, uh, yes, agreed. But. I mean, it was different for, 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 for Freddie Spencer. It was different times. There was a lot less choice then, obviously. There was a lot less sort of, you know, um, a breadth of, of, of competitive machinery. Um, and I think he just had to retire too early, really. That was his biggest problem was just how short, incredibly short his career was. Maybe Burn we night. shouldn't ask Giacomo Agostini about hiring Freddie Spencer. That could be a little bit contentious. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, let's ask it to the listeners. We've chosen Wayne Rainey, Eddie Lawson, and um, Freddie Spencer as our sort of top American racers from that 10-year fantastic era for the country in the sport. Send us some comments on Twitter or on SoundCloud or wherever you listen to this podcast. Let us know who you'd pick. I mean, none of us opted for Kevin Schwantz, guys. I mean, is that, uh, is that a failing of ours or is the injury record just too... I don't too much of a disadvantage. Uh, did Schwantz, I mean, to me, like, Schwantz was spectacular to watch. Um, uh, and he did a lot on talent. He did a lot. Um, uh, he had a, he did, did, Schwantz had a riding style and he was going to follow that riding style and nothing else. Now, and they made a bike which allowed him to be really competitive. He was, you know, much faster than the Suzuki. It was very much um, him winning rather than Suzuki winning. Um, but he again we're talking about sort of like you know swapping uh, swapping manufacturers and stuff um Schwantz is is forever linked to Suzuki and how would he have fared if he'd have been jumping off of different bikes you know jumping between bikes i think um uh, Schwantz would have could have gone one or two ways he could have gone a, a bit like um uh, Valentino Rossi jumping off the Amar and onto the Ducati sort of thing so it, you know it, it that could have gone one of two ways he could have either been sort of outstanding or failed uh, and i think that if Schwantz was on the right bike he would have figured it out um but if he wasn't on the right, right bike i think he would have struggled a lot more now are we also being dismissive of randy's natural talent and maybe john kaczynski as well i mean there's there's a rider who could just jump on various types of motorcycles and, and won with most of them you know and i would argue as well dave your point about Schwantz and suzuki is fantastic is he perhaps the biggest case of what if in terms of never changing a brand or a motorcycle, or does that honor fall to Mick Doohan? Uh, I guess so. Yeah. 
I think we all wanted Mick to change brands just for an entertainment point of view because it was quite tedious watching him clean up in certain years in in 500s. Um, yeah, I think I think Schwantz would have made a success of, of, of any switch that he made. To be honest, he was that naturally gifted, that strong. Um, and what are we talking? Oh, yeah, Randy or John. I mean, yeah, Mawola and Kaczynski were both super riders, but when we're talking about the best American riders, we're talking about the best the riders of all time or, you know, several of the, the best riders of all time and they they weren't quite at that level i would say but they were still very very good but yeah you wouldn't there's no way you would put randy or john kaczynski ahead of the likes of rainy or lawson spencer or schwantz or kenny roberts senior i think that's a that's a more pertinent one that we should uh, be mentioning going off at a complete tangent my hot take is that mick doing is uh, so single-handedly responsible for the motor gp class um because um uh, it was so boring watching um, uh, uh, that, that, that era. He was so much better than everyone else, and he had so little interest in everything else. Um, that um, and it coincided with the rise of you know you you had um, uh, uh, Crayfar and you uh, and, and Aaron Slight and uh, Carl Fogarty that era of um, uh, of World Superbikes. Absolutely fantastic racing. Um, uh, the manufacturers were getting bored with two strokes anyway, and I think Doing was very much pounding the uh, nails into the coffin of uh, uh, of the of the two stroke era and and uh, sort of uh, br- uh, uh, ushering in the uh, uh, MotoGP. So uh, that that is my completely unfounded and wild take on um, how MotoGP came about. Well, MotoGP exists because of the peak of development when it came to the two strokes in the early 90s, right? I mean, you know, when Doohan started riding a big bang, uh, you know, you could see, I wouldn't say the beginning of the end, but there was definitely going to be a sort of cycle that was reaching some sort of apex there. But uh, yeah, I mean, good points, Dave. And but yeah, I mean, we can count Kenny Roberts. Um, well, can we count Junior as well there? I mean, as, as a world champion, we are trying to identify American no. races that would fit into current MotoGP. Uh, that's you know a, he did a, a ride a fo- of- I mean he he did fit into MotoGP. He actually rode a MotoGP uh, bike and almost um, uh, and came very close to winning a uh, 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 winning a, a MotoGP race as well. But um, yeah, so yes, we've all, we've already had one American racer in Moto or well from that era in MotoGP. Point four. Uh, Laguna Seca finally had like a $20 million investment. I think last year it was completed, guys. They did some renovations on the paddock, also resurfaced the track. They built a new bridge that goes from the paddock to the exterior of the track. Um, Could MotoGP go back? Maybe there's still some critical elements of that circuit in terms of runoff and safety that means that you know grand prix racing can't visit there again um but thanks to sort of steve steve english our as well colleague on the paddock pass podcast he was telling us a bit about flat rock which is a brand new circuit uh, less than two hours from nashville about three hours from atlanta um with a very distinctive kind of bank turn it's had tilke helping with the uh, development of the layout and the whole facility is supposed to be opening in 2024 but that's also been a venue mooted for a second or perhaps a replacement stop for MotoGP in the United States. I just wondered, you know, what are your feelings? Should MotoGP move away from Texas or, you know, perhaps could it squeeze in another date? Um, I mean, first of all, I interviewed uh, Jerry Burgess in, I think, 2009, uh, 2009 or 2010 about Laguna Seca, and he'd refer to it as a shitty little track uh, (laughs) then. because the bikes never, never really, they barely got out of fifth gear. Um, it, the, the, it's always been a, a very small track. Um, uh, you know, like turn one at Laguna is still one of my very favorite uh, uh, corners, sort of anyway, just because of the way it is. The, the you know, over the crest, blind before um, that hard hairpin uh, at turn two. But um, yeah, it, it's not really safe. It's not really suited to, I think it'd be like, I'd love to see Moto2 at, uh, at Laguna. I think it'd be, Moto2 at Laguna would be fantastic. I don't think MotoGP would, I think MotoGP is too big, too fast, too much aero. Um, even with the new rules, it'll still be too fast, too much aero for, for Laguna Seca. I, uh, I think we're more likely to see World Superbikes th- at, at Laguna Seca. I think Flat Rock looks very interesting. Um, it's in a bit of a sort of a strange place, sort of caught between two sort of large cities, but at least an hour, hour and a half away from from both of them. Uh, so I don't know how much 
um, accommodation or whatever is going to be around. It risks becoming a little bit of an Aragon in that um, in that respect. Um, but it, it does look being like being a proper full scale Grand Prix worthy facility, um, and it's in the heart of uh, the Amer- well, U.S. Uh, motorsports territory, not motorcycle racing territory, but motorsports territory, because it's sort of in the heart of NASCAR and the other, uh, and the other sort of like um, motor racing stuff. So, yeah, I think it's uh, it's an interesting thing, and, and I don't think it will replace Texas because I think it's much more likely that we'll see two uh, two um, tracks. The only problem is it's it is a. I mean, it's still quite a long way from uh, from Austin, but it is it's closer to Austin than, say, Indianapolis or uh, Laguna might be. Although I am now going to have to go onto Google Maps and actually find out whether <laughs> I'm talking absolute nonsense or not. I mean, I know uh, I have a rough sense of U.S. geography, but uh, I'm likely to be proven wrong. Neil, are you a fan of Cota? Do you think the MotoGP should really sort of make its home there for the long term? Um I'm a fan of so many things about Coda. Um, maybe just not the track layout itself. Um, I think we've talked about it a few times in this pod in the past. We're not. Mm, it's not like we've had uh, a ton of great racing to go off there. Um, there have been notable good races, but they've kind of been the exception rather than the rule. Um, it's a series of heavy braking zones and low gear corners, hairpins don't really lend themselves to, to good close racing. Um, I really hope to be proved wrong this year. Um, but the the setting is cool. The city of Austin is fantastic. Um, it, it's pretty expensive, but then I guess where in the US is not that way at the moment. Um, I think it's a, it's a pretty iconic venue for sure. Um, but yeah, I just wish that the circuit they could chop a few little bits off it because I think it's it's close to being a fantastic track. The first two sectors are, are fantastic, but um, it gets a bit Mickey Mouse, I think, in the middle part after the back straight, and that really, I think, has a negative impact on the racing. American listeners or Moto America fans, um, send us some suggestions. Where would you like to see MotoGP racing in the US? Would, should it be Laguna Seca, somewhere like Miller, Barber? Let us know uh, your thoughts. 2024 means 25 years of fly racing. You might be wondering what fly racing actually actually consists of. Well, they are one of the biggest gear names in off-road riding and competition, but they also have a vast spread of products for all two-wheeled activities. When you want a new jacket or gloves or protection, you tend to think of, say, Alpine Stars, Danies, Revit, or more. But fly racing is also a name that should be on your radar for quality products. Have a browse at flyracing.com. We were speaking about Kota, and let's um, go a bit more into that subject. Subject. Uh, guys, um, question number five for you. Um, who could potentially clean up this weekend? Alex Rins or Mark Marquez? Because we've only had three riders to win in the MotoGP class since 2013. Uh, three different brands, in fact. And this is going to be the 11th Grand Prix at the venue. Uh, Dave, your vote first. Well, I mean, like Pekka Badiai looked like he was going to clean up last year um, <laughs> until he decided to see crash at turn two because he wasn't really paying attention. Um, Turn the two bike has was been too good, Dave. The bike was too because, good. That's right, because the bike was too good, which is too the stable. best excuse for, for 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 crashing ever. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, I mean, turn two has also been resurfaced, so the bumps because there were some horrible bumps there it used to be quite interesting sitting. Um, uh, you go up over the hill, and then on, you, you can sort of sit on the uh, on the inside of the track, looking across of it, and you would see the uh, as riders pitched into it that there was a big bump right on the inside um, uh, where they were turning in, which they would try and avoid. But if you didn't, you could see the uh, really see the suspension bottoming. Um, so I think the, the track is going to be an awful lot faster because of that and because they've uh, repaved the stadium section there as well. Um, that is going to help the Ducatis, I think, also. Um, I think Pekka Banyaya has something to prove. I think Jorge Martin really has something to prove. But if there's going to be a track where... Um, where Mark Marcus is going to come into his home, own is going to be is going to be here. Um, the Yamaha doesn't. The Yamaha does okay around Kota, so yeah, yes, there's a good chance that Alex Rins will be close to the podium. But I don't think he's going to clean up. If if we're going to go with who's going to clean up, the obvious choice would be um, Mark Marcus. But um, I would keep an eye on Daniela versus Martin because that is shaping up to be properly tasty. 
Neil, Jack Miller and Jorge Martin won at Cota in Moto3. Um, you also have uh, Marit Mignales, Pekka Bagnaya and Raul Fernandez who won in Moto2. So there's quite a few riders on the grid who have previous victorious form at the venue. Uh, as Dave mentioned as well, I mean, Alex Rins, uh, Honda's only win last year. He's still not fully fit. I mean, when you see him limping around the paddock and of course he's trying to get used to the Yamaha, Dave pointed out that extra bit of top speed might help on that along that vast straight that they have. But uh, oof, I mean, it's this could be an hour of reckoning for Mark Marquez, right? I mean, this is the first, uh, I don't want to say, what's the equivalent of like a match point or something? I don't know, first favorable hunting ground for, for him in terms of his reference with the Ducati this year. The first free kick? Direct free kick, perhaps. Yeah. Ooh. Penalty. God, David Emmett come out of the football metaphors. I'm going to retire. I think you need to rewrite this section, Ed, to be honest. This uh, analogy <laughs> is all wrong. Um, but yeah, I think it's yeah, it's definitely going to be the first weekend this year that people expect Marquez to win. No one did that, I think, in Qatar, nor did they do that in Portugal. Um, whereas this is going to be different. Um, obviously, Mark... Um, didn't attend last year's race because he was still recovering from that um, thumb injury that he suffered in Portugal. Um, but the previous year, he wasn't successful, but he had that wonderful fight back from the, the dodgy start where I think um, something happened on the line. Basically, one of his mechanics hit one of his sensors, I think, which caused him to get a really terrible getaway um, when they were moving the tire warmer on the grid. Um, and then obviously his, his record before that speaks for itself. Um, so yeah, you, you, you would think that Mark is going to be up there. I mean, he's been pretty competitive in the races we've had so far. Um, I think with a better qualifying, he could have been fighting for the podium on Sunday in Portugal. Um, he is still making these little mistakes though, when he's really in critical moments and pushing for fast lap times, he's still kind of reverting back to how he used to do things on the Honda. And I think that is something that could hold him back a little bit this weekend, because we know how long and how complicated this track is. It's the longest, I think, on the calendar. It's got the most turns on the calendar. There's a lot to kind of get your head around and to learn. But certainly what Mark was able to do in the Honda through the first sector. I mean, no one could ever really live with that whenever uh, he was sort of in his pomp at this track. Um, so, yeah, I think he goes in probably as the favourite. One name that you didn't mention that I would uh, I would also, um, in fact, two that I would like to point out. First, Maverick Vinales always was, was really quick. I'm sorry. Circuit. I thought you said Maverick Vinales. I did, yes. And I don't know if you were paying attention, Dave, but um, he was actually quite good in Portugal. It was like one of the first times that I've been able to say that for a while. And the second is Anaya Bastianini, who won the race here in 2022 and won it brilliantly, in fact. Um, and we saw Bastianini in Portugal, pole position and uh, on the podium in, in the race on Sunday. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we're starting to see the, the kind of the best of the beast again. Um, so, yeah, two names that I would kind of... Yeah, have roughly on the kind of provisional uh, roster of, of challengers. Maverick uh, came close to being the first rider to win with three different brands. I mean, we he did sprint... win with three. No, no, no. He won with three different brands. So we're this counting whole the sprint. Separate... Yeah, oh, of course we are. Of course we are. It's an incredibly stupid um, uh, difference to make. It's a you know look. It's not. A, it's not a full length Grand Prix. But if you're going to count um, a um, a, a six-race sprint would be after a red flag as a, a, as a race result, as a victory, then you have to count a, 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 a Sunday, sprint race. Dave. It was a feature race on a Sunday. Oh, so we're oh right. Well, let's scrap all of those races that um, uh, that P, that uh, Rossi won in um, in Assen from his uh, from his record then, because that wasn't on a Sunday either. That was a Saturday race. So it's it's nonsense. Maverick Vinales became the first uh, uh, rider to win on three different brands in the in the GP era, I think, in the MotoGP era. So no, full marks for that. But that means that he's going to finish fifteenth in Cota. No, but That's I think just you know, the way it works. I'm siding with Neil here. I mean, the Aprilia gearbox couldn't go the full distance in Portugal. So, you know, technically that's not really a Grand Prix win. But it's it's nonsense. It is absolute nonsense. There is no point. The sooner we get rid of this. I mean, the, the, the other thing is there aren't even decent statistics on the, uh, or you can't find decent statistics on sprint wins and sprint podiums uh, on the Dorna website. They really need to fix that. Um one of these days, I'm going to build my own database and um, uh, and sort that out, just so that I can actually look all these things up. Um, but no, I mean, I I don't care what people say. That was a that was a Grand Prix victory, and it was. I mean, it, hats off. It was a really superb uh, race, and that is Maverick Vinales' problem in a nutshell. 
on his day, he's just outstanding. It's just that, you know, his day isn't every Sunday like it is for Mark Marquez, for Pekka Benyaya, for Fabio Quattararo, for Brad Binder, for all of these other riders. Well, you could argue if his RSGP wasn't flicking out of fifth and sixth gear on Sunday, then he would have had that Grand Prix as well. Or would that yeah, no, race? Well, yeah, definitely. Won, yeah, but... definite, it, it, I mean, Why definitely. Not? Well, he was about a second behind Jorge Martin with one lap to go. Yeah, with a dodgy gearbox. Yeah, I mean, I mean, all right, what ifs, ifs and buts, you know, I know. But I think, you know, it was a, an incredibly competitive weekend for him. And yeah, why why can't he do it again? Let's wait and see. Listen, yes. guys, on our last our last point on this podcast, um, because we are coming up, of course, to the only Grand Prix with the American Grand Prix on this on the slate on the calendar. So I'm going to ask you for your favorite American Grand Prix memory. Um, over to you first, Neil. Is there anything that stand out from the the many visits? Was '88 Laguna Seca the first American Grand Prix? I think mm, it was the. F- no, I don't think it was the first American Grand Prix. I think it was the first Grand Prix at Laguna Seca for sure. Um, I think there might have been one prior to that. Oh, God, I really should have done this research before. Um, well, was but, it, I put you on the spot with a question, but um, I mean, it was <laughs> it was a couple of years, I, I want to say to 90, perhaps. Was there three years at Laguna? Uh, no, there was uh, there was more. I think it stopped in 94 was the last one. Then it okay, came back in 2005. Right. Um, so, yeah, there's a couple. I mean, there's a few obvious ones, which I will leave to you, gentlemen. But um, I enjoyed very much. There was a great Rennie Schwantz battle at Laguna Seca in 1990 um, before Schwantz high-sided out the final turn and broke his wrist. Um, but that was that was a really interesting fight between those two at home on kind of Rennie's home territory. I think his house almost looks out over part of the track still. So it really was very much his territory. And Schwantz was, uh, Schwantz was riding with the camo helmet scheme at that point as well, I seem to remember. Um, and then I would also say my first race that I did in America was in 2015 at Indianapolis. And there was a great battle that day between Mark and Jorge Lorenzo. And this was peak Lorenzo, probably in the best form of his life. Um, and he was sort of doing that hunting Mark down. I know, in fact, he was leading most of the race and then Mark mugged him right at the end. But it was a great kind of head-to-head between the two, well, two of the top three guys in the in the championship that year. So, um, yeah, that was, that was pretty special. Speaking of Indianapolis, I think 2012, Casey Stoner's high side. I mean, if you look at the, the footage of the accident, I mean, it is brutal. I mean, the bike is absolutely trashed. And I think he might have even broken his leg in that accident. He, I did. He, broke, he, he suffered very severe uh, injuries in his foot. It kept him out for a very, very long time. Actually put Jonathan Ray on the Honda for a little while. Um, uh, yeah, and I think that was one of the um, uh, sort of like one of the events that just sort of like reinforced uh, his his conviction that it was time for him to retire. One of my favorite memories, Dave, uh, Nicky Hayden's 2006 win at Laguna Seca. I'm not sure if it was in 05 or 06 where he did the jig on the podium, but, you know, I'm going to pick 06 because, you know, that was his championship year as well. It felt like a real sort of zenith in the, in the modern era of MotoGP for the US. Uh, it hasn't really come around since. You could say one day in Assen for Ben Spees, kind of put it back up there again, and Colin Edwards had some flashes, but... I can't believe it's sort of seven years since Nicky Hayden's been gone now. So, um, you know, yeah, I hope we'll sort of think of him and remember him when we go back to Kota this weekend. And, of course, there's the uh, the Rossi Stoner battle in 2008. So uh, what's your nomination? Um, uh, well, there's, a, there's a few things. First of all, I think we have to go for best livery, which is obviously the 2005 Yamaha, uh, the yellow and black livery for uh, Colin Edwards and... Um, uh, Valentina Rossi, which is just the best looking MotoGP bike. Uh, well, all right, it's the second it's second best looking Grand Prix bike ever after the Kajiva, um, and it's the best looking sort of special livery. It just looked absolutely fantastic. Um, obviously, like two thousand eight was thrilling, generally because it was such a visceral race. Um, you could feel the. Um, those two really hated each other by that by that point, and Rossi had to win. He knew he had to win, and he did everything he could to keep Rossi to keep Stoner behind him. Um, again, during the same interview that I did with uh, uh, with uh, Jerry Burgess about, it, he sort of like said like 
they only had one objective in that race, and that was to get ahead of uh, Stoner, because if Stoner got ahead, they knew that they'd lost the race. So it was just like, get ahead of him, get in his way, um, stop him from getting past whatever happens, uh, and then do what you can and then see what happens at the end. Um, that was great. But my, I mean, my um, favorite personal memory is Indianapolis, uh, was it 10 or 11? Um, Kenny Roberts um, riding the the Yamaha 750 around uh, uh, around the Indianapolis um, uh, fairground, uh, riding the mile. I got to stand trackside. That was just visceral. I cannot explain how amazing that was and how fast he was going. I mean, he was properly pushing that thing. He, that wasn't a demonstration lap. That was, he was demonstrating how fast that bike was, not sort of, you know, isn't it a pretty motorcycle? Um, but I think in terms of GP, it has to be Mark Marquez sprinting down pit lane, you know, parking his bike up against the pit lane wall after it broke down, jumping over the pit lane, sprinting down to get on his bike number two, and then going out and uh, setting a pole lap. That, that to me was just exceptional. Yeah, 2015, I think probably one of the best pole laps that any of us have seen. Um, and it was so rough and so wild. But uh, yeah, he still managed to do it despite having got his heart rate up to, I'm sure, around, I don't know, 150, 160 for that <laughs> sprint on pit lane. So yeah, that was, uh, you know, it was, I think, one of Mark's best moments. I think you're talking about your own running heart rate there, Neil. I think Mark Marcus's level might be slightly lower. <laughs> Oh, mine's much higher than that, I can assure you. <laughs> I mean, Rossi Stoner in 2008 was was pretty cool to see. I mean, when you watched it live and you saw the post-race reaction, you thought, well, you know, this is a proper spat. But it was kind of confusing as well because I remember thinking, Rossi, you're a cheeky bastard. And But then you kind of thought Casey's reaction to it was a little bit, um, I don't know, it, it was, was, it was overly that serious. Was the point. I don't know. No, that was the point. That was exactly the point. The only way they were going to beat um, Casey Stoner that year was by making Casey Stoner beat Casey Stoner. Uh, and Rossi really got under his skin um, in part because, I mean, like, it was just this... I mean, it would be really interesting if that happened this year to see how race direction would handle it. Because there was a couple of times where you thought, you know, somebody deserves a, um, a long lap penalty, and I'm not quite sure who. Um, uh, Rossi was clearly trying to rough him up and, uh, and rough him up in a in a legal way um, and stop him. But uh, and he knew that he didn't have the bike to take the fight to Stoner, so he had to find he had to find a different way. He was doing all sorts of things. I think the run across the dirt is. Um, irrelevant really i mean it's fun it's it's entertaining uh, and i think um our friend the late andrew wheeler uh, made quite a lot of money off of that for, off, of, off of the photograph sequence that he made of that um but th like some of the uh, some of the other passes he was making around there were um just really really good um i also have to say to go back to turn one at laguna casey stoner through to i think casey stoner passed someone and i can't remember who Lorenzo. through to sorry Jorge Lorenzo. Yeah, at turn one. Yes. Uh, yeah, honestly, take, like passing someone at turn one at Laguna Seca is probably the bravest move you can make um, anywhere ever, and that was really special. Guys, just before we wrap things up here on the Paddock Podcast, the Paddock Pass Podcast, let's hear your predictions for victory this weekend. Uh, put the money on the table. Neil, you first. I'm going to have to say Mark. Bold choice. <laughs> Dave, uh, I would like to go for Mark, but I think I am going to go for, it's going to be a, a comeback. It's going to be Pecco's comeback this week. And I think Pecco's going to do the double. I mean, I don't think so. I think Mark is going to win, but I'm sort of like thinking, I think it'd be much more interesting if Pecco did the double. That's my tip as well, actually. I've got Bang Naya down for the win. He was looking like he was going to do it last year. And now, uh, like you say, he's going to sort of right the wrong, so to speak. They've resurfaced that turn two, so there's no reason for him to fall off. <laughs> Well, that's it. Thanks for listening to Dave, Neil and I drone on for yet another week. Podcast 400 is coming up. Anybody you'd like to hear from on the Paddock Pass podcast, then let us know through X, SoundCloud comments or YouTube comments. Uh, we'll also listen to any questions or bench rating topics you might have through the same channels. Don't forget to save your, man uh, your MotoGP fantasy team changes this week and join the Alpine Stars Paddock Pass podcast league 
which you can find with a simple search on motorgp.com and in the Game Hub section. We'll be back with the first of our daily paddock note shows from Thursday at the Circuit of the Americas. That one will be free for everybody to listen to on Patreon, but then we'll have interviews and more reactions on Friday and Saturday for our paddock insiders. Join up for just 10 bucks a month or try a free seven day trial and find out what you're missing. Other than that, we'll have our post race show posted as soon as we can on Sunday evening.